Glad you're back, and I'm looking forward to how the Lord is going to work in our own hearts. All the children can be dismissed, four years old up through third grade. You can follow Mr. Ken right out the back door for children's Bible time. All the children, four years old up through third grade, you can meet Brother Ken back there. And I'd like to ask you to take your Bible tonight and turn to Psalm 34. Would you do that? Psalm 34 in the Scripture. Psalm chapter 34. And as you're turning, I want to apologize because last night I failed to talk about the ladies and how they brought visitors. If you're here tonight as a lady and you brought a visitor last night, can I see your hand? If you're a lady here and you invited a visitor last night, okay, good, okay, all right. Now, keep your hands raised. We count them this way. If they were here Sunday morning, they are 100 points. If they were not here Sunday morning, they're 500 points. And if they've come for the first time, they're 1,000 points, so... You'd be thinking about how many points you have, okay? And tonight, men, if you invited a guest and they've come for you, the same point system. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you, how many of you ladies brought a visitor? Let me see your hand. Raise your hand if you brought a visitor last night. Last night, all right? Now, if you have 500 points or more, keep your hands raised. All right? If you have 1,000 points or more, keep your hands raised. How many points do you have, Miss Nancy? Okay, anybody with more than 1,000? Or a thousand? Okay. After the service, Miss Nancy, you be sure and see me. Now, tomorrow night is going to be Sunday school night. How many of you are Sunday school teachers here at Bible Baptist Church? Let me see your hands. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. All right. It's your responsibility, if you're a Sunday school teacher, to get your class here. We'll go by percentage tomorrow night. Okay? So, tomorrow night, uh, we're going by percentage. If you get a visitor, that is, anybody that would that's invited by your class or by you to come they count as 10 percentage points extra, okay? So call, get your class enlisted, and get them to inviting, and let's see what we can do in getting visitors here, okay? Uh, this be a tragedy of effort proportion if any of those cards were left on the desk back there. I, I don't want Pastor to get more gray hair over all that ink that's put out on those, uh, on those cards. So uh, we, we want to help him keep his youthful look. So uh, let me also say tomorrow night, so, so if you get... Your class here, we're going by percentage tomorrow night and, uh, and, and enlist the help of your class. Class, help your teacher, okay? And the teacher with the most points will get something off the back table. So let's work at this and I urge you to go after it and see what God will do. Then Thursday night is going to be youth night. That means all the young people are responsible to get folks here, 19 years of age and younger. And so let's see what we can do. Now, if you can't get someone here on the night that's appointed to you, but you can get them to come another night, We'll allow that, okay? Just get them to come, and let's see what God will do in using us to get folks here. By Thursday, I'll have invited 30 people to the meeting. I've already invited some people, and so I'm on my way to that, but I want to be an example in that regard as well. So let's work at getting visitors and, and tell our friends and our family and uh, the ones that we love and the ones that we don't love and try to get them to come, okay? And ask the Lord to use us as we get folks to come to these services. All right, men, if you invited a guest tonight and they're here, would you raise your hand? Men, if you invited a guest and they're here, anybody? All right, Brother Larry has one. Is there anybody besides Brother Larry? Okay, after the service you see me, okay? Let's give all these inviters a good round of applause. Can we do that? I do want to mention two things. There are several items on the table. There's some books. There's some things that my boys have made. Uh, there's some music CDs and some preaching CDs. There's, if you'd like to get the th a thumb drive of all of our messages, we have that available for a fraction of the cost than if you were... Uh, to buy all the messages on CD. So that's, that's back there as well. And if we run out, we'll get more. Uh, but we use what comes in off the table to go to the mission field. And every year since 97, except the last couple of years, we've been able to go overseas. And uh, God's been good that, that way. This year, Lord willing, in November, we're going to go to Italy and preach the gospel in Grosseto and Pisa and uh, preach the gospel to the people there in Italy. And my, what a great and needy opportunity this is. Great and needy place this is. There's 60 million people in Italy, 60 million people, and there are about 12 uh, fundamental Bible-believing churches like this one in Italy. Now, that's astounding. Uh, that would be like going from Maine all the way down to Georgia and putting 12 churches. And so that just kind of gives some perspective. So uh, these are good missionaries that we've been with before and that we're looking forward to being with again. And in the next few days, we'll have those tickets purchased and everything squared away. So pray, pray for us along those lines that God will use that in a mighty way. And then just one more thing quickly before we get into the message. Ken 
has been traveling with me uh, since the second week, I think, of August. And I'm so thankful that he can be with us. He, he graduated from Ambassador just recently as an evangelist major, and he feels like the Lord wants him to eventually be in evangelism, but he felt like the Lord wanted him to get some local church experience working on staff and helping a church. So the Lord's provided that opportunity come this November up in Rhode Island. And so hope that you'll pray about that. Tomorrow night's offering is going to go to Ken. And I'm glad that that can be the case. And I'm looking forward to giving in that offering. And you pray about what God would have you do that night. Let's pray right now and ask the Lord to help us as we get into His Word, shall we? Father, I need Your help as I preach tonight. And I need Your guidance. I pray that You'd grant that. I pray that You'd fill me with Your Spirit and help me to say what only You would have me say. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that tonight You would teach us about this matter of revival. I pray that we would study, that we would open up our hearts, that we would that we would see where we need revived. And I pray that You'd touch us in a mighty and a special way tonight. Lord, if there's anyone here who is not saved, I pray that they would be saved tonight and that something supernatural would happen in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Larry Burkett was a public speaker and a Christian and a speaker on finance and how to manage your finances and to order your finances according to the Word of God. He's now in heaven. But when he was alive, he, he hosted a Chinese pastor in America, and that Chinese pastor had traveled all over America preaching. And Larry Burkett took him to the airport. And on the way to the airport, when he was making his trip back to China, he asked, what do you think of the churches in America? And that Chinese pastor said, it's amazing what the churches in America can accomplish without God. Now, the truth is, is that there are many churches in America that are churches in name only. That is, they're not Bible preaching churches. They've kicked Jesus out a long time ago. They've kicked the Word of God out a long time ago. The Bible isn't front and center. And there are likely even some churches like that in this town. But there are churches that are Bible preaching churches that believe that salvation is only through Jesus Christ and grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ that it was bought and paid for at the cross, that there's nothing you can do to earn salvation or work for salvation. And I speak of those churches now directly because I would say one of the greatest needs in America amongst God's people is revival. Real Holy Ghost revival. Real Bible revival. Real back to the basics revival. And I want to preach tonight on revival. It's the burden of my heart. I believe every one of us needs a, a good dose of revival and we need revival from time to time and, and we need God to refresh us and renew us. So if I were to, to, to try to figure out what this thing of revival is, I might ask people on the street, what would you say revival is if I were to try to find out what revival is? And, and, and some people would give me different definitions. Uh, there are uh, rock revivals and rock group revivals and there's revivals of, of certain styles today. And the word revive is actually something that you might even find in a grocery store. And, and there are different ideas of what revive means and what revival means. Uh, if I wanted to know what revival means, I would need to know what it means if I was going to have it. True? Right? Are you here with me tonight? Are you listening to what I'm saying? I would need to know what revival means if I was going to have it, if I was going to pursue it, if I was going to partake of it, if I was going to understand it. Uh, I might, if I wanted to know what revival meant, I might go down to the local bar and ask the people in the local bar or saloon what revival meant. Now, I'm not saying I would get the right answer. Uh, I might be surprised what I would get as far as answers, asking people completely inebriated out of their head what revival means. If I wanted to know what revival meant, I might go ask a group of Christians and they might be able to tell me what revival meant. And probably I would get different ideas. Uh, some would say, well, revival is when you get real excited about God. And I believe that getting real excited about God is important. Some people would say revival is when you start raising your hands and shouting amen. And I'm all for praising the Lord. And, and, and if you need to raise your hands and shout amen, uh, Although that doesn't happen too much in the North Country, you know. I, 
I grew up in Minnesota, not very far from here, and uh, we had a $50,000 pipe organ in the church that I grew up, and a lady who knew how to play it. I mean, she could make that thing really sing and vibrate, and it was something enjoyable, not uh, not uh, a pain to listen to. And, and, uh, and the church choir sometimes wore robes, and uh, you weren't allowed to say amen in our church. It was against the rules. In fact, if anybody ever did say amen in our church, everybody was trained to turn and look at that person so that they would never do it again. You know, that was kind of the way it was in our church. And, uh, and, and if anybody really got excited in our Minnesota, Scandinavian, German uh, kind of church, uh, they might write amen on a card and hold it up and hope nobody saw it. You know, that was about the extent of the excitement in our church. And there was a sweet old black lady named Irma Jacox, and she sat over here, and she didn't care what anybody thought. She was going to say amen, and she would. She'd say, mm-hmm, that's right, amen, mm-hmm. And she'd say amen from her waist up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she was just nodding and saying amen. And if anybody turned and looked at her, she'd just look at all them and smile, say, you couldn't shut Irma Jacox up. Uh, But some people would say revivals when you say amen and shout. Some people wrongly would say revivals when you start speaking in tongues and rolling in the aisles and having holy laughter. Some of that went on uh, somewhere in the country last week. Uh, Some people would say revivals when you get real quiet and real somber. I would imagine if I asked a group of 50 Christians, there's a possibility I'd get a myriad of answers. If I wanted to know what revival meant, I I might ask a group of preachers. But even if I asked a group of preachers, I still might get a bunch of different answers. And some would probably conflict. But you know, if I want to know a truth, then I need to go to the source of truth, the Bible. And I want us to do that tonight. I want us to open the Bible. We'll come into Psalm 34 in just a minute. But I want to lay some groundwork as to this matter of revival and what it really is. Because if it's our greatest need, then I want it. If it's what I need the most as a Christian, then, then, then tell me how to get it. If it's what the church needs, and if actually this church or any church is functioning just fine without the help of God, then we're in a heap of trouble. So what would you say revival means? Well, if we were to open the Bible definition of revival, you know how when you look up a word, you'll see the word and then you'll see it, you'll, you'll see it kind of phonetically given how you're supposed to say it. You'd see it broken down, re and then vive and then all, and you'd see that in some kind of special brackets. And then you might see different definitions like A in parentheses and a definition. And then B and then another kind of a, a different nuanced definition. And then C. And then D, and I want to do that tonight. I want to open up the Bible and I want to see what God has to say, but I want to focus on the last definition. If you were to see from the Bible, I believe you could do this. A, A, this would be the first definition of revival. We're just trying to define it tonight. We're not trying to give all the ins and outs and all the instances of revival in the Bible. We're just trying to define it so that we can understand it enough to pursue it and pray for it and have it. Uh, first of all, letter A, if I were to give you a Bible definition of revival, I would put this, man in close fellowship with God, again. Let me say that again, man in close fellowship with God, again. And next to that letter A, I would put these references, you can look them up on your own spare time, because we want to pursue the very last definition of revival, or the last nuanced definition. I would write down Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and Revelation 21 and 22. Let me give it to you in a, summar- in, in a summation. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, God creates the world. Remember? God created the world. He created uh, the plants and the animals. He created the fish and the, the birds. He created the, all the beauty that we see and, and then some. And He put man in that world. He put man in the garden. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life after he'd formed him from the dust of the ground. And then later he looked and said, it's good, the light and the darkness. It's good, the water and the land. It's good, the birds and the fish and the, and the beast. It's good, but one thing he said was not good is that man was alone. And so he put man to sleep. First time anesthesia was ever put in practice. And he put man to sleep, did a surgery, took a rib out of man, and he made woman. And when Adam woke, woke up, he said, whoa, man, that's how she got named. And, and so, and so she, 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 she was beautiful to him and she was attractive to him and he was attractive to her. And, and all of a sudden, God formed marriage. One man, one woman, 
and, and he began to walk with man in the garden. There was no sin. There were no, there were no dark clouds of trouble. There were no valleys of, of sin. There was no transgression. Iniquity hadn't stained the world yet. Uh, it, it had entered into the universe via Lucifer and, and the one third of the angels in heaven, but it hadn't, it hadn't hurt the, it hadn't hurt the garden. It hadn't come that far. Genesis chapter one and two, uh, Genesis chapter two, God is walking with man. Perfect, unbroken fellowship. You know what that, that really makes the devil jealous. The devil hates it when man and God are walking in fellowship. He hates it. He wants to divide that. He wants to destroy that. And so he did. He came down. He enticed Adam and Eve to sin. They sinned and they invited judgment upon them and upon the world. And the world's never been the same since. But do you know, even before they sinned, God had a plan for redemption in place. And they tried to cover their sin and their own right self, self shame with their fig leaf aprons. And do you know what God did? The first thing he did, God took away their fig leaf aprons and he killed an animal. I was witnessing to a Hindu man in, in Virginia right at the beginning of COVID in 2020. And I asked him to tell me what the Hindus teach about sin. And, and I asked him, what, what do they say is the solution to sin? You know what he told me the Hindus teach about sin? They teach that it's a sin to kill an animal. And of course they would. Because you might be killing some reincarnated relative, reincarnated relative or something like that. And, and so it's a very, very grievous sin. And I said to this man, I said, do you know, that's a very interesting concept. So you know what the Bible teaches the first death was? And he said, no. I said, an animal. And I said, do you know how it died? He said, no. I said, it was killed. I said, do you know who killed it? He said, no. I said, God. His eyes got big. I said, do you know why? He said, no. I said, to atone for sin, the sin of man. That's right. God took away the fig leaf aprons because they weren't good enough. And by the way, your self-righteousness isn't good enough to get you into heaven or satisfy God. And your religion isn't good enough. And your tradition and your morality and your confirmation and catechism and your sprinkling or being dunked or poured or squirted or however you do it out here in South Dakota, that's not good enough to get you into heaven. It's not good enough to God. It doesn't please God. And so he took away their fig leaf aprons and he killed an animal. Blood was shed. An animal died. And that animal skin was used as coverings for their nakedness. Now God was satisfied. Do you know what happened? Fellowship was restored. God was teaching the way of salvation is through the death of a substitute. The bloody death of a substitute. And so here this animal was slain and now Adam and Eve had a way back to God. They'd been banished from the garden. They could no longer be in the garden. They'd been banished from access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had no more access, but they weren't banished from God. And God made a way for redemption. So, so through redemption and through that process, all through the Old Testament, now man had a way to get back to God. And there was salvation when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was, pre was coming into the wilderness and John the Baptist was preaching. And he said, stop everybody, look that way. There's the man that we're talking about. He's the God man. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You see? And Jesus died on the cross. He made a way for man and God to be in fellowship once again, right? And so when you get saved instantly, you're brought to a place of life. Oh! Life, life, where's that? Is there a word for life? Ah, there is a word. Is there a word for life in what we're talking about with revival? Yes, the word revive means life. Again, vive means, vive means life. Viva means life. Revive means life again. Because when you get saved, you get life. You don't know what life is till you get saved. You don't have eternal life. You don't have abundant life until you come to the cross. And some of you here tonight may have gone through the motions and you may have gone through the form and you have a form of godliness, but you've denied the power thereof and you're lost and you're dead in your sins and you need to be born again tonight. You need to be saved. You've never had life. Maybe you've walked the walk. Maybe you've talked the talk. Maybe you've known the language. Maybe you've sung the songs, but you've never been saved. And tonight you need to be saved and have life the first time. If you've never been saved, you don't need revival you need vival you need life the first time how many of you have gotten saved i'm not asking you to raise your hand but i want you to answer that in your heart how many of you know that if you died today you'd go to heaven if you've been saved then guess what you have life 
But those that get saved, do we always walk with the Lord in sweet, unbroken fellowship? Yes or no? No. Sometimes we walk away from the Lord. Sometimes we do our own thing. Sometimes we turn a cold shoulder to God. Sometimes we get a stubborn will. Sometimes we get mad at God. Uh, sometimes we get angry at Him. And, and, and sometimes we act like two-year-olds. I mean, really. Act like two-year-olds. We say, I'm not going to forgive. You should see what I see as a preacher. You should see. I wish I could show you. Sometimes I come into a church and people are like this. One person's on this side and the other person's on that side and they're cutting glances and casting scowls and boy, they're looking at each other over top of their hymn book and they're giving each other the business. During the preaching, that's a fact. That's a fact. Sometimes I come into a church and people are like this. Back to back. You, you'd think that only two-year-olds act this way, but full-grown adults act this way. And it's just a shame. And it's abominable. Sometimes it's happening in a family. Sometimes it's happening uh, in a Sunday school class. Sometimes one side of the church, I preached in a church some time ago, and, and I had preached three or four meetings before, and every meeting was increasingly better, and we'd have people saved. We'd have visitors come. They'd sing the stars down. It was a wonderful meeting. I came this fourth time, and it was cold as a tomb. People had left got mad at God, got mad at the preacher, got mad at each other. Some people were sitting over here. Some people were sitting over here. It was arranged just like this church and it was probably about the same size, just a little bit bigger. And, and boy, there were just a few people. Nobody was talking to each other. You know what happens in a church like that? I mean, five, maybe three minutes after the closing prayer. Boom, the place is empty. People are in line to get out of there. Nobody wants to hang around something like that. That's not a good sign ever in a church. When people won't fellowship and won't hang around, uh, no, boy, they want to get out of there. They don't want to talk to each other. They're just hardly, they're just enduring to the end. All the misery of sitting next to those old good, no good rotten Joneses or Smiths or whoever it is causing all the trouble. And I'm telling you, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And that's the way it is sometimes in a church. We're not right with God. We're not right with each other. Cold, we're hard, we're selfish. And we need life again. And do you know what you need? Life again. Uh, anything that's happened in my life is based, number one, on my salvation that's good. And number two, on how often I've been willing to let God revive me. Anything that's good in my life, anything that's bad in my life is based upon me and my unwillingness to let God revive me. God wants to give life again. And you know when you first got saved how awesome it was? The burden of sin was lifted. The joy of God was there. I mean, there was no guilt, no shame. And the freedom was there. And you thought, wow, this is wonderful. But after a while, we get closed eyes and we get hard hearts and we get our own stubborn ways. And sometimes we go back to sinful ways and sinful habits. And we need life again. Peter needed life again. He denied the Lord three times. And he needed the Lord to revive him. And a good cry helped him. Broken heart, A broken heart helped him. Going out and weeping bitterly helped him. Remembering God's word helped him. Peter, need re Peter needed revival. Hey, uh, there were times when people in the Bible needed revival. Samson needed revival again. And walking round and round and round in the gist gristmill, blind and blinded by the enemies. That helped him think things through a little bit. You know, sometimes we have to let tragedy come into our life or God has to send tragedy in our life just to help us to think and just to get our, our attention and just to get us to focus. And, and, and you know, we need life again. Uh, Jonah needed life again. And he got some time to think about it. Three days and three nights, fully paid accommodations in the belly of a whale helped him think about it. And the sea was wrapped around his head and he was thinking about it down in the belly of the whale and down in the belly of the whale. He decided he was going to get right with God. He didn't know if he'd ever see the Lord ever again or see the light of day ever again. But he just decided having a clean conscience was good whether he ever saw the light of day or not. And a clean conscience he got when he confessed his sin and got right with God. And that wasn't good for the whale. He up chucked Jonah right up on the sandy seashore and Jonah headed off and said, I'm going to go. The Lord came to him the second time. Aren't you glad that God comes the second time? I want to say, uh, it's life again. It's God and man in fellowship again. But you know what you find in Revelation chapter 21 and 22? God walking with man and fellowshipping with man and dwelling with man and sin is no more. There won't need to be revival meetings in heaven. I'll be glad. Until then, I'm going to work trying to get every revival meeting I can. 
Until then, I'm going to try to stir up every congregation I can. Until, up, until then, I'm going to try to stir up every person I can on Facebook with some post about revival and about getting right with God. Until then, I'm not going to ever apologize for preaching and getting upset against the devil and against evil and against carnality and lethargy and apathy and indifference. I'm not going to ever apologize. Somebody says to me, preacher, are you okay? Sometimes you look like you're going to have a heart attack up there. Your face gets all red and your veins stick out on your neck and your eyes get real wide and you beat the pulpit. I mean, that doesn't feel too good. I mean, you go, you're okay? Yeah, I'm just fine. And I'll tell you, I'm never going to apologize for preaching like this until my dying day. And then I'm not going to apologize. You know why? Because I know you go back home and you get deluge from the radio and social media and TV on the way the world wants you to dress and live and act and be and have an attitude. And, and, and I've only got just a little bit. So I'm not going to ever apologize for stomping my feet and pounding my fist and pointing my finger, raising my voice and spitting over all over the first three rows. If you'll, if you'll sit in the first three rows, you'll never get COVID. All right, look at what the Bible says now. I want you to think about this. I was going to tell you a COVID joke tonight, but I figured 98% of you wouldn't get it. Anyway, uh, I, let her be. Let her be. Uh, what, what are we going to do? We, we've got to find out what revival is if we're going to have it. If we're going to pursue it, if we're going to understand it, if we're going to ask God for it. I mean, I don't want to ask God for something I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't think I need it if I can't understand it. Am I, am I right, Brother Forsberg? I'm trying to get us a good definition. So we're looking at the definition. Letter A definition is man in close fellowship with God again. He doesn't say you must be born again and again and again and again. But you do have to be revived again and again and again and again. Once you need to be born again. Many times you need to be revived. Now, let her be. I would say in the Old Testament, it's men worshiping God in faith and looking for the first coming of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. In the Old Testament, it's men worshiping God in faith and looking for the first coming of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it's worshiping God by faith and looking for the second coming of Jesus you, you show me a church that talks about the coming of Jesus. The preacher preaches about the coming of Jesus. The people live in light of the fact that Jesus could come today. They study what the Bible says about the coming of Jesus. They go out and order their lives thinking that Jesus may come today. And they witness thinking that Jesus may come today. And they read their Bible excited about the fact that Jesus may come today. I'm going to show you a revived church. I mean, I'm, there's no question about it. Hands down. Church, I, I was preaching, Pastor Yoder. I can't even understand this. I can't understand this. I was preaching last year on the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture up in Minnesota. And a man came to me after the service and said, I went to my preacher and asked him why he doesn't preach on the second coming of Jesus Christ and preach on the rapture. You know what he said? He said, because in seminary they told us not to preach on it. Whew. You know, you could take all, if you took all, this is a fact, this is a scientifically proven fact. If you took all the seminaries and put them end to end, all the way around the world, it'd be a good thing. <laughs> Most seminaries are an absolute waste of space. And I'll go on record. And I'll say that even about most Baptist seminaries and even sadly about most fundamental Baptist seminaries. They train their preachers to live in misery and unbelief and fatalism and ask questions that nobody in the world even asks or thinks about or cares about. Most people I know in the pew are trying to keep their marriages together trying to keep their family together, trying to figure out how to raise their kids. And in seminary, you go down deep and you stay down long and you come up dry. And most people that graduate from seminary can't preach their way out of a wet paper bag. Anyway, I didn't mean to get all excited about that. But I just want to say this. That, that in the old... Why would a seminary professor tell a preacher to not, not preach on the coming of Jesus Christ? That, that seminary professor is bad off. I don't know who he was. I don't know where he was, but I'd like to talk to him one on one in a dark back alley. Anyway, uh, I just want to say what a tragedy to tell a preacher not to preach on the second coming of Jesus Christ. I, I think I'm going to go with the Bible on this one. The Bible says preach the whole counsel of God. And in the whole counsel of God, you know what that means? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, you show me a Christian that's excited about Jesus coming, thrilled about the coming of Jesus Christ, ordering their life like, witnessing like, praying like Jesus is coming today. And I'll show you a Christian that's thrilled to, to be saved, excited about coming, living their life, realizing they may stand before the Lord to, before the sun sets. 
They've done, they're not living like they've got lots of time. They're living like they've got hardly any time. And by the way, I, I've studied this. This is an interesting fact. I've studied and I've traveled. And the, you know the most exciting churches I'm in? Just, just like all things being equal, the most exciting churches I'm in. You know what they are? Military churches. And usually military churches overseas. And I thought, why are these the most exciting? My wife was grow, raised in the army uh, as an army brat. Her dad was in the army and family was in the army. And so she was in military churches in Germany and many places. I preached in Japan. I preached in Italy and military churches all over. And they're exciting. And you know why they're exciting? Because the people know they're only going to be there for a couple of years before they TDY and they're out of there. And so they got to get everything they can. And there's a family overseas that where people actually talk their language and they love to come to church. And the preacher knows he's only got them for a little bit. And so the people aren't taking the preacher for granted and the preacher isn't taking the people for granted. And guess what? You've got excitement right there. You've got revival. And do you know what's a characteristic of all those churches? They believe in and they preach and they talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, a revival in the New Testament looks like somebody worshiping God by faith and somebody that's looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. And if I were you, right next to that passage, you can look it up later, I'd put 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Right next to that passage, I'd put 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. And I'd study it later. All right, now I'm trying to figure out, I want to know what revival is. What does it mean? What is revival? What's these, these are different facets of the definition of revival. All right, I'm going to look at C. What is revival? All right, are you ready? Being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what revival is. These aren't complicated definitions. They aren't deep definitions with hard words to understand. They're simple definitions that anybody can understand. Being filled with with the Holy Spirit. You said, preacher, is that like water filling a glass? Well, I wouldn't debate you on it. And I'm sure there's some certain nuances that would, that would come with that analogy. But, but I would say it's more like a hand filling a glove. That glove by itself is not going to accomplish anything. It's not going to wash dishes. It's not going to change the oil. That hand or that glove by itself is useless. It can't weed the garden. It can't harvest any kind of fruit from the garden. But you put a living hand in that glove and something's about to happen. Watch me now. My life by itself is empty. I desperately need the hand of God in my life. And when he speaks about the filling of the spirit, I believe it's more like the hand filling the glove. I need the hand of God in my life. Right next to that verse or that definition or that nuance, I would put Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the spirit. That means it's a command. And if it's a command, every Christian can do it. Now, either right now, you are filled with the Spirit or you're not. Are you filled with the Spirit? Right now. In other words, does, is He bearing fruit in your life? If you're filled with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. He didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. He said the fruit of the Spirit. And when I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm yielded to the Spirit. I'm saying, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? I'm asking Him to fill me. I'm, I'm yielding. I'm saying, go into every nook and cranny. I, I, I want to confess any known sin. I want to be right with you, and I want you to be fully in charge. It's not, Lord, you can go into every room except that room. No, you can't go in there. It's not, Lord, you can go into every room except the basement. Please, if you wouldn't mind, stay out of the basement. It's not, Lord, you can go into every place except the attic, or you can go into every room except the uh, master bedroom. No, no, you're giving God the key saying, you got the whole thing. By the way, the Holy Spirit didn't come into you when you got saved so that he could be a temporary guest to come and go. You're not an Airbnb for the Holy Spirit. He came as a permanent resident. He came not to be a guest, but to take over. He came to be in charge. And if you want to go ahead as a Christian and live your life holding on to this room and hiding that room and, 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 and checking the Lord here and checking the Lord there and not letting Him have all the keys, then you go ahead and see, you go, tell me how that works out. It's nothing but sheer misery. It's nothing but trouble. It's like me trying to drive the car from the back seat or from the passenger seat. It doesn't work out very well because that's not the way God intended it. God intended to fill you and He intended to control you and He intended to make your life useful. That can only come when you confess known sin. All right, letter D, I would say this, that revival is being right with God and right with man. Right with God and right with man. Uh, in other words, you have right worship and right relationships. That's what I would say. 
you have right worships, you have right worship and right relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is, is that if you look in the Bible and you cut this book, anywhere in the Bible, you cut it. You know what I believe? It's going to bleed two concepts, worship and relationship. The whole point of the cross is so that you could get your worship right. The whole point of revival is so that we can have our worship right. And do you suppose the devil wants another person worshiping Jesus Christ? No, he hates it. Just like he was jealous of Adam and Eve with, with unbroken fellowship with God, he's jealous of, of any man, woman, boy, or girl worshiping God. Unabated, unhindered, uninhibited. He's jealous of that. He doesn't want that. He does not want this church coming together with pure heart and sincere motive, singing praise to God. That's the last thing he wants. And by the way, he wasn't too happy with you a few minutes ago. I hope you know that. And by the way, I hope you're okay with the devil not being happy with you. I hope you're concerned, and you would be concerned if the devil was happy with you. I hope you'd be concerned about that. Uh, the fact is, is that if you cut this book anywhere, it bleeds worship and it bleeds relationship. Anytime that children of Israel were worshiping idolatry, it's because the devil enticed them to do so. You say it bleeds relationship? Oh, yes. The devil doesn't want you to have a right relationship with God and he doesn't want you to have a right relationship with man. And revival at its essence is getting right with God, getting right with man. Now, what we do when we have a revival today, we put up banners with beautiful, nice greenery and the word grow to just kind of capture your attention and the scripture verse and, and 2022 and Bible baptism and the church brand and logo. And isn't that just a nice, I, I can't get over how, how, I can't get over how beautiful these banners, this church must have some money. Anyway, uh, uh, that, j that's what you do today. You know what they did in, you know what they did a hundred years ago when they had revival? I've got pictures of this in my files. They'd put up a big banner behind the preacher that said, Get right with God! Get right with man! Oh, that's a little offensive there, don't you think? I mean, that's a little, little forward, don't you think? J. Oswald Ch Smith, who, who was the main preacher for missions, came down from somewhere in northern Canada, down to Toronto, Canada, to be a part of an R.A. Torrey meeting. He wanted to hear the preacher R.A. Torrey, who was D.L. Moody's close associate. And, and do you know one of the things he saw all over the train cars, all over the streets, all kinds of little cards, Brother Forsberg would like this, with one thing on the front, get right with God. That might get the attention of a sinner. Maybe we're not bold enough. Maybe we're too soft. Uh, Sam Jones was a Methodist revival preacher. In fact, uh, the Reimer Auditorium that's built today in Nashville, Tennessee, was built for Sam Jones to preach by a man named Reimer at the Reimer Auditorium. And do you know who Reimer was? He was a wicked cuss of a sinner. I mean, he hated God and hated preachers and hated Sam Jones and made public threats that he'd kill him. And Sam Jones didn't care. Sam Jones would blister sin one night and blister sin the next and blister sin the third night. And he'd go after sinners and sometimes he'd name them publicly. Mr. Reimer got saved. And after he got saved, he built that auditorium so Sam Jones could have a place to preach. You know what Sam Jones would do with his team? On one occasion, he got all his team together and he said, I want you to go into the business district. He said, I want you to go and ask to speak to the proprietor of the business and I want you to say one thing. You look right in that proprietor's eyes and say, you are headed straight to hell and walk out. Well, guess what? He had a crowd to preach to that night. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, that you should do that all the time, but I simply am saying that there was a holy boldness back then and a fearlessness when God's men blistered sin. Now the preacher points his finger, clears his throat, looks at you wrong, cross-eyed, and people get offended. The preacher I never come back there. Well, preacher, I hope you never stop preaching hard against sin. And I hope that this church never gets tired of hearing the preacher preach hard against sin. And if he does some, someday happen to rattle your cage and go pillaging through your cabinets, I hope you'll say thank God for a preacher that's got courage and insight and foresight and backbone to preach against my sin. He hadn't been talking to your wife. He didn't have time to follow you on Facebook and figure out all the crazy things you're into. He's just walking with God. And do you know what he's trying to do? 
get men right with God than right with each other. Look here, I can pretend like I'm right with God and sing like a nightingale and be mad as a mean as a snake towards my wife. I'm not right with God. I can get up and quote 50 verses in a row and I can sound all so beautiful with oratorical savvy. And, and if I'm not right with my kids, I'm not right with God. Don't pretend like you're right with God if you're not right with man. See, revival is getting right with God and right with man. Right worship and right relationship. But if I were to give my favorite definition of revival, it would be this one. We've talked about A, man in fellowship with God again. B, we talked about worshiping God in faith and looking for the first coming of Christ in the Old Testament. Worshiping God in faith and looking for the second coming of Christ in the New Testament. We talked about being filled with the Spirit. We talked about being right with God and right with man. But here is my most modern and most recent Dwight Smith definition of revival as far as I understand the Bible. Are you ready? Here it is. A Christian's spiritual senses renewed. A Christian's spiritual senses renewed. You say, preacher, where do you get that? All right, your Bibles are open to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Do you see what the Bible says here? Psalm 34 and verse number 8. Look at what it says. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth him. Do you know when, when I'm spiritually not revived? Listen, my taste buds aren't working right. Pastor and I were at, at uh, Dairy Queen last night testing out our taste buds. And uh, he said, have you ever had COVID? I said, yeah, I think I might have had it a couple times. And I'm going to have it as soon as I can just to get out of work. But anyway, uh, he, he said, have you ever had COVID? I said, yeah, I think I have. He said, man, my taste hasn't been right since I had COVID. How many of you had COVID? I got COVID in October of 2020. We were on our way from Georgia to Texas and then Texas to California. And we had a meeting canceled because of COVID. And I was never so glad for a meeting to cancel because I wasn't feeling so hot myself. And, uh, and, and so the meeting canceled and that gave us some time to rest. And then we had to take the new trailer that we had just gotten and drive all the way out to California. And I, I could hardly make it, Brother Evans. I could hardly make it through New Mexico. I said, honey, you got to drive. So my wife got behind the car and by behind the wheel and she took off. Uh, I know my wife looks like a dainty little thing, but she's a trucking mama, let me tell you. And, and she pulling that 45 foot trailer down the road at lock, mock speed. And here we are going along. And I, I, I had a hard time staying up. I was achy in my back, achy in my head. It would hurt here and hurt here and hurt here. And, and you know what tasted bad? Two things that I love, coffee. Tasted bad, tasted bad. Something was wrong. I didn't want it. You know what else tasted bad? Doritos. I mean, how could you know I'm sick when Doritos take bad, taste bad? I couldn't even taste it bad. Something's wrong with those Doritos. Well, it wasn't something wrong with Doritos or coffee. It was something wrong with my taste buds. And you know, when you've been eating at the hog slop of the world, the things of God don't taste good. Preaching doesn't taste good. The Word of God doesn't taste good. Family devotions don't taste good. Personal devotions don't taste good. Singing the songs of Zion doesn't taste good. Fellowshipping sweet with God's people. That doesn't taste good when you've been eating at the hog slop of the world. It doesn't taste good at all. You've got an appetite for junk food. Or you, the devil's just burnt your tongue. Now I'll tell you, I, you know what my favorite coffee is? I'm going to tell you right now. It's not Starbucks. It's not Dunkin'. I'm going to tell you, this is my favorite coffee. Going into a truck stop and going over to that special coffee machine that has French vanilla, caramel macchiato, double shots espresso. And say, it's all pre-chemically engineered to taste good. <laughs> and I like French vanilla. That's my favorite kind of coffee. My wife thinks I'm crazy. But anyway, that's what I do. And I get a French vanilla. And you know what I hate to do? Drink it right away. Because you know what it usually does? It burns my tongue because it's too hot. And there are a few things in my life that I can't stand more than and I can't stand more than than burnt a burnt tongue. My taste buds are all mixed up for the whole half a day. Can't taste anything. Nothing tastes good. And I want to say something. When you're not right with God as a Christian and you need revival, 
your taste buds for the things of God need renewing. Listen to the scripture, Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Proverbs 24, 13, my son, eat thou honey because it is good. It's Hebrews 6, 4, 5, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and been, were my, made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. It's impossible for them if they fall away to be renewed. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You see, when you first get saved, your taste buds are brand new. And you've got to keep them constantly exposed to the word of God. You have a renewed sense of taste. But wait, you have a renewed sense of hearing. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 2 and 3. Revelation 2 and 3, all the way at the end. I'm trying to make this a Bible definition of revival because any other definition would be fairly useless and would lead us all off track. But look at what it says in Revelation chapter 2. He speaks to seven specific churches, not seven ages. You can talk to me later if you want to know. He's speaking to seven specific churches. Look at Revelation 2. And to each one of these churches, look at what he says. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hmm. Verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Look at what he says in verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To the church of Thyatira, all the way down in verse number 29. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hmm, interesting. Look at what he says in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he says in verse 6, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To the church of Pergamos, he says, verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the church of Laodicea in verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you think he was trying to get their attention concerning their ear? Now, it's interesting, he said, He that hath an ear, do you have an ear? You say, well, I happen to have two. Well, you know what that means? You're doubly responsible. But you know, when I'm not right with God, I'm not listening very well. My wife talks to me and she rolls her eyes and goes into the other room. You know why? Because I'm not listening very well. They say when you're first married and you're sweethearts, you learn how to whisper sweet nothings into each other's ears. But as you grow in marriage and as you become older, you learn how to yell into the other room. <laughs> anyway, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that you've got to learn how to hear. And to listen. Are you listening? Sometimes I'm not listening to the Lord. Sometimes I'm dull of hearing. Sometimes you think I was deaf as a doornail. What is the matter with me? God's speaking. God shouldn't have to come to me five times. I should hear him the first time. I mean, am I the only parent that has that problem? I tell my kids five different ways. I said, son, can you go in the other room and get something? He says, yeah, 15 minutes later, he still hasn't come back. He comes back, he says, what did you say again, Dad? What did I say again? Okay, so now I've gone to, I'll repeat this two or three times. Now, did you get it? Look at, now you repeat to me what I said to you. And we go through this whole ceremony. It's quite remarkable. And then finally, he goes into the other room and he gets it. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to see if he's listening. You know, I wonder if the Lord feels us that way with us. He says the same thing over and over. And we break the same sin and law over and over and over. How grieved he must be. How much more he could accomplish through our lives if we that had ears to hear would hear. You see, when I'm revived, my sense of hearing is renewed. Are you ready? When I'm revived, my sense of taste is renewed. When I'm revived, my sense of smell is renewed. You speak to what do you mean? Well, you should write down Ecclesiastes and the book of Song of Solomon, specifically Song of Solomon, and you'll find reference to the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. In the book of Psalms, it speaks about Christ's garments being dipped in kasha and myrrh and aloes. When you're right with God, guess what? You can smell the sweet fragrance of Christ. God gave you a nose to tell the difference between a skunk and a rose. And I'm wondering if most Christians today even have a nose. Well, is it preacher? The preacher was saying something about Jesus. Just because the preacher says something about Jesus doesn't mean he's preaching the Bible. Well, that, that singer up there, they sang something about Jesus. It said a Christian album on the 
CD cover or on the playlist just because they sing something about Jesus doesn't mean they're following Jesus. You need to have a diff, uh, the ability to smell the difference between a skunk and a rose. Now, do, do you know? But your, your olfactory senses aren't working real well when you're not right with God. Uh, I have a friend out in Beale, and a few years ago, he got a concussion. He was playing basketball. Somebody stepped behind him, and he fell back and slammed his head on the gym floor. And ever since, this was probably 10 years ago, ever since then, he hadn't been able to smell. In his office right now, down in North Carolina, there's a great, big, huge, old white whale vertebrae. I walked into his office. I said, what is that? He said, that's a, a vertebrae from a whale. I said, what? He said, yeah, we were vacationing out on the outer banks of North Carolina. And he said, there was this beached whale and it was half eaten and it was rotten flesh. And all my kids tried to get close to it and they couldn't get close to it without throwing up. But I can't smell a thing. So I got right into it all the way up to my elbows and I worked and worked and worked and I got me a vertebrae. And I brought it home and I bleached it and that's what I got right there on my coffee table. Real conversation piece. But you know why he could get that? Out of that rotten flesh? Because he couldn't smell. And I wonder if sometimes we as Christians get right up to our eyeballs in the rotten flesh of this world and we can't smell. Why? Because we need revive. And you know, COVID hit our taste and our smell. Sickness causes trouble. Sickness causes a deadening, a weakening of our senses. Wait, I need to be able to smell. I need to be able to hear. I need to be able to taste. I need to be able to see. That's why the psalm writer said, said, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I want to ask, can you see the Lord? Sometimes we get so blurred with all our vision and distracted with everything else that we fail to see the Lord and He's right in front of us. And sometimes God has to send difficulty and tragedy to wash our eyes with tears so that we can see again afresh and anew. A few years ago, I was going through trouble that I didn't like and I didn't want and I couldn't understand why I was in the middle of it. And as I was mowing the lawn, I'd talk to the Lord. I'd tell the Lord all about my trouble as if He didn't know. And and one day, all of a sudden, the Lord said, well, I'd say we're pretty close right now. I cried tears over this. I grieved in my heart over this. But you know, Brother Forsberg, I was closer to the Lord than at any other time in my life. And God didn't send a preacher with a trailer and a revival meeting to get me revived. He sent trouble to open my eyes. Wait, I've got to see the Lord. I've got to hear the Lord. I've got to taste the Lord. I've got to smell the difference between right and wrong and the goodness of the Lord and and that which is rotting flesh. But wait, I need to feel. Now, please, please, we're not putting too much emphasis on feelings. Believe me. And the first time in an independent Baptist church, somebody starts to feel the Lord and it feels good and they get happy, there'll be a wet blanket real close to just put a kibosh on that fire oh strange fire strange fire we don't want strange fire let me tell you strange fire in an independent baptist church is about as likely as a flood in the sahara it's not happening anytime soon you don't have to worry about strange fire happening but you know the bible talks about feeling the bible says that there are certain ones who sear their conscience with a hot iron and they are past Would you say it would be good or bad if I took my hand right now and turned the stove on in the kitchen and just held my hand on that stove until the flesh burned off? Would that be good or bad? You said, preacher, that'd be bad. That would cause permanent damage to your feeling. And you know, when I toy around and play around with sin in my eye gate, young people, listen to me, watching reels, searching random things on the internet, getting around mom and dad's parental filters. When I do that, It sears my conscience so that I can get to a place where I don't even feel God. I want to feel God. I want to feel His presence. I want to feel Him near. I want to feel His sweet breath of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to feel the wind bearing me up and carrying me on. I don't want to get to a place where I'm past feeling. And if I'm there, I bought to get on my face as fast as I can and beg God for revival. Now I want to say this and I'm done. Everywhere I go, people say, Preacher, you've got a gift. And you know how to speak to people. 
And I wish you could speak to thousands. And quite honestly, I wish I could too. And I'd love to someday speak to thousands. But watch me. We're never going to speak to thousands and see thousands of people saved until we as a church get right with God and get revived. And pastor, I believe this. We have longed for and pursued thousands of souls being saved. And I'm for evangelism. I'm an evangelist. But watch me. You can have evangelism without revival, but it'll only last a little while and it'll lead into compromise if it's just that. But you can't have revival without evangelism. You know what I believe we've done with the church? We've so set our eyes on evangelism that we failed to have revival. And that'd be like taking a couple that has cancer in their reproductive organs and saying, have a baby, have a baby. Come on with me over to the maternity ward. We'll put you right here until you have a baby. And we're waiting for them to have a baby when they need to deal with the cancer and be revived. When they deal with the cancer and are revived, the baby will naturally die. You see it? I need revival. We as God's people need and we need a renewal of our spiritual senses. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I as a preacher don't want to live my life without You and look good and move along just fine without the Holy Spirit. I can't do it. And I don't dare do it. And Lord, we as a church, we can't live without real Holy Ghost revival. Lord, we can't do it. And we don't dare do it. Would you revive your church right here? Revive our spiritual senses. Renew them. Our sense of taste. Our sense of hearing. Our sense of smell and sight and feeling. Would you send revival to your people? Heads bowed, eyes closed. How many of you would say, Brother Smith, I'm saved. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. But you'd say, preacher, I know God's spoken to my heart about a need for revival. I need my spiritual senses renewed. If that's you, would you slip up your hand tonight? Amen. Amen. Lord, I need my sight. I need to hear once again. I need my taste. It seems like it's, it's, it's just burnt taste buds. Preacher, pray for me. Anyone else? Say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I need reviving tonight. God has spoken to my heart. Good. Good. Question number two. How many of you would say, Preacher, I want to pray for this kind of revival in this church. Not just so that it ends after the preacher and the evangelist leaves and the special day is done. I want to pray that God will send a real Bible revival to Bible Baptist Church in the days and weeks and months to come. If that's you and you'd be willing to pray for revival in this kind of way, would you slip up your hand right now?